Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mario, for the introduction, and thank you to the organisers for inviting me to give this uh, this presentation. Now, I realise there's probably not a large number of solar system planetary atmospheric scientists in the audience today, so what I'll try to do is take you through the uh, basic parameters of what the Jovian atmospheres look like as a class, and then um, some of the highlights of the science we've been able to accomplish using thermal infrared instruments over the past couple of decades or so, and then a look finally to the future of what we'd like to be able to do in the mid-infrared um, in the coming decade. I'd like to thank uh, all the co-authors that have contributed to this work, and particularly the European Research Council for funding uh, the team at Leicester University. So uh, why the giant planets themselves? So each of the four gas giants in our solar systems can be th thought of as planetary scale laboratories for understanding fundamental fluid dynamics without the complicated influence of things like mountains, continents, valleys and oceans that get in the way of those pure fluid dynamical flows. If you like, we can study weather without any interruptions. These worlds, as we've just been hearing in the previous presentation, were uh, can be thought of as time capsules for the earliest stages of planetary formation at the beginning of our solar system. They also appear to have a selection of habitable or potentially habitable satellites about them. And a key question is how the giant planets formed and evolved and therefore led to the architecture of the solar system that we see today. And finally, each of these four worlds can be thought of as archetypes for the brown dwarfs and extrasolar giant planets that we can't hope to spatially resolve anytime soon. But because of the rotational characteristics and the chemical composition of the four giant planets, we can think of them as templates for what might, for the processes that might be active on those more distant worlds. Now, planetary astronomy is often seen as being a support uh, to the, the missions that we send uh, to the outer solar system. But as a solar system scientists specialising in the giant planets, we see missions maybe once every generation or so. They're certainly not uh, once every year. Jupiter has been well studied by the Galileo mission back in the 90s, by the Cassini flyby early in the 21st century, and most recently by the Juno orbiter, which is currently uh, in orbit around Jupiter and has been so for the past four years or so. Saturn was explored for 13 years by the Cassini mission, uh, but uh, came to an end in uh, September of 2017. But the poor ice giants in the distant reaches of the outer solar system have only been visited once by Voyager 2 with technology that's now several decades old. And that's one of the reasons why ground-based planetary astronomy is such an important element of the study of those two distant worlds. To give you a flavour of what the current cutting edge for uh, observations of the giant planets. Here are uh, two images of Jupiter. The one on the left is formed from a combination of Vizier imaging at 8.6 and 10.7 microns, showing the famous banded structure and the large swirling anticyclone, the great red spot. And on the right hand side is an image taken at five microns. Now at five microns, we're able to see relatively deep into the planet. And what you're looking at are clouds uh, appearing as dark in silhouette against a a brighter, deeper internal glow of Jupiter, a heat that's been left over from the formation of the planet itself. Now, as we go further out in the solar system, it gets harder and harder to take observations. But here you can see an example of observations of Saturn showing the beautiful ring system, the banded structure, and also the small scale perturbations related to uh, the eruption of a gigantic storm on Saturn about 10 years ago that we'll come back to uh, in a few slides time. It gets even harder when you go out to the cold objects such as uh, Uranus. Uranus gets down to about 50 Kelvin at the cloud top. So it's a challenge to try to measure the temperature contrasts across the disk of Uranus, but here are observations from the troposphere and stratosphere that give you a sense of how the air is circulating on that world. And then finally out to even more distant Neptune, where I think one of the best images we've ever got in the mid-infrared is represented by that one on the left at eight microns, where we're actually sensing stratospheric temperature, but the small scale perturbations that you see are all real, and we believe they're to do with upwellings and downwellings of methane gas within the atmosphere of the most distant ice giant. But before we get into too many of the details, let's just set the scene for what you're looking at when you see these giant planets. The, the, the most 
a typical thing that you see when you look through a telescope, irrespective of the wavelength that you're looking at, is that gorgeous banded structure. There's a series of uh, zonal jets that whip east and west are able to keep latitude bands separated from one another. Now the presence of those east-west jets are the results of the rapid rotation of these worlds and the conservation of angular momentum as air moves up over the, uh, the bright white zones. So you've got upwelling air that expands, adiabatically cools, and you get a condensation of aerosols that creates the white colour. Then what goes up must ultimately come back down again, and it sinks over the, uh, the belts, which are the reddy orange stripes that you see in this image. And as it sinks, it's compressed, it heats up, and you re-evaporate all that cloud material. So what you're looking at there in front of you is a circulation pattern from the zones into the belts that drives the picture uh, that you're seeing. And of course, those zones and belts are then interrupted by large scale cyclones and anticyclones, such as the Great Red Spot. Now, all of that is just in two dimensions so far, looking at the clouds themselves. But what happens if we then extend into the vertical? Well, atmospheres are made of a series of different layers that are controlled by uh, the amount of sunlight that's being deposited and the amount of energy that's coming up from the deeper hidden layers below. And if we go from the thermosphere and ionosphere, where auroral energy might be being deposited, creating uh, uh, spectacular light shows over the northern and southern poles, which can be seen in the mid-infrared as well as in the ultraviolet and near-infrared. As you go deeper into the stratosphere, here we see a photochemical soup where methane is split apart by sunlight and recombined into long-chain molecules like ethane, acetylene, and uh, even uh, PAHs are present within the atmospheres of some of these giants. Then you pass through the cold trap known as the tropopause, into the troposphere and the troposphere is where all the weather is taking place, where all those cyclones, anticyclones and banded structures are located. Finally, you hit the condensation clouds, condensation clouds of things like ammonia, uh, NH4SH and potentially even water ice down at five to 10 bars on Jupiter. And below that is a huge question mark. Things like the Juno mission are then needed to get down to greater, greater pressures. So, Broadly speaking, the mid-infrared, which we'll talk about for the rest of this presentation, is sensing the stratosphere, where all that photochemistry is taking place, and the troposphere, where the weather is observed. Now, the thermal infrared allows us to make uh, measurements of the environmental conditions on these different worlds. For example, we can use the collision-induced continuum of hydrogen and helium as our thermometer for taking the tropospheric temperatures. We can measure the distribution of gaseous species that are condensing, in particular ammonia via the N and M-band absorption features. We can look at the opacity of clouds just by their um, continuum contributions. We can look at chemicals in the stratosphere, as I was just mentioning. We can measure the temperature in the stratosphere using methane as our stratospheric thermometer. And finally, we can look at species such as phosphine gas, which have no right being there. They shouldn't be present within the spectrum of Jupiter and are only visible because powerful circulation patterns are dredging up that material from far greater depths, far higher pressures and higher temperatures. And we can use that to trace the motions that we see within these atmospheres. So the bottom line is that the M, N and Q bands are really versatile and helpful regions for diagnosing these environments. And just if all of that was a little bit quick to set the scene, I want to try and explain to you why these parameters are so important. If you look at a weather map of Europe today, the things that you'll be told are things like temperatures, humidity, the winds at various different altitudes, and the cloud coverage. And you need those parameters to understand the meteorology uh, that's going to be shaping our weather over the coming days. Without the thermal infrared, you lose several of those parameters and you're left with measurements of winds from the visible and near infrared and measurements of cloud coverage from the near infrared and the visible. You lose all information on temperature, humidity and winds as a function of height and that's why the thermal infrared is so important when we're looking at an enormous planetary scale laboratory for studying meteorology and climate. So I'm going to take you through some of the highlights of mid-infrared science that we have uh, so far. And I'm going to break it down as a function of time scale. Things that happen very quickly, rapidly, and require people like uh, Mario to help us out with uh, DDT time on, on the VLT. 
things that happen much more slowly and require a program over uh, months and even years and even some studies that we've been able to do now with a, a record of mid-infrared observations that span several decades. So let's start at the beginning, short timescales and here I'm talking about things that happen over the course of just a few hours and this is regularly occurring within the atmosphere of Jupiter and every now and then in Saturn's atmosphere as well. You get plumes of moist material welling up from the deeper atmosphere of Jupiter, punching through the various overlying cloud decks and depositing white, fresh, icy material into the atmosphere where we can see them. And on the bottom left, you see an amateur image taken by uh, Don Parker that shows a series of little white spots that we liken to individual uh, complexes of thunderstorms with all their associated uh, lightning strikes. Again, with only the visible, we only have those L albedo and aerosol contrast to look at, but in the thermal infrared, we can determine their chemistry, we can determine their opacity, and we can determine their temperature, which allows us to diagnose what the physics is of this rising column of moist air. We can figure out how it's powered, we can figure out that the expansion at the top is cooling down the atmosphere and causing condensation, and we can even look at things like precipitation, so the precipitation of maybe ammonia snow falling from that mushroom cloud of cold material, or something that we call mush balls, which is a, a kind of hail but a mixture of water ice and ammonia ice uh, together uh, in one place falling into the deeper atmosphere. So these rapid plume events, and in fact there's one happening right now in the Jovian atmosphere in one of the northern belts, they allow us to study how convection and meteorology work in an atmosphere that's purely hydrogen. And that's a bit strange when you think about it because that means that the condensate material is actually much, much heavier than the surrounding air. And so it's gonna be, you have to overcome that energy barrier in order to loft it up to great altitudes. So this is an example on Jupiter from a few years ago. Uh, on Saturn, we had an even more spectacular event where this plume erupted in the northern hemisphere and then the prevailing zonal winds began to redistribute that white cloud material as a function of longitude. Literally that white stuff was being blown downstream by, by the prevailing winds. Now we were able to use VLT and the IRTF and the Cassini spacecraft at the time to track the emergence of two fuzzy warm patches high above this, uh, this storm cloud. These two warm patches were migrating westwards around the planet and this chart shows that at a particular moment in about April, May of 2011, those two fuzzy warm patches merged together and we were not ready for what happened next. They merged into the largest anticyclone that we have ever seen anywhere in the solar system, something like three times larger than the Great Red Spot. It was only present high up in the stratosphere. It features temperatures some 80 to 100 degrees warmer than the surroundings and it was only visible in the mid infrared. We could not have seen it with wavelengths that were sensing the, uh, the reflectivity of the cloud tops because it was a glowing hot air mass of enhanced chemicals, faster winds and extremely high temperatures. And this seems to be a consequence of that bubbling convection down there at lower levels within the atmosphere. Now, another spectacular event that happens on very, very short timescales are impacts within the atmosphere of Jupiter. We've not detected them on the other planets just yet. Now, some of these impacts we see as bright flashes in amateur data, and those bright flashes tend not to leave any impact debris. So it's not so great for follow on in the mid infrared. But every now and then, such as this event in 2009, which we call the Wesley impactor, they leave a dark cloud of, uh, of, of debris in the atmosphere of Jupiter. And it's much darker than any meteorological features. It's got silicates, silicas present within those debris clouds. We were able to use Vizier to measure the chemistry of that cloud and figure out that there was no oxidizing chemistry taking place. It was entirely reducing. And what that tells you is that the impactor didn't get deep enough to get to Jupiter's water and it didn't carry in its own water. So it wasn't an icy comet. And we were able to deduce that the impactor must have been a water depleted body, such as an asteroid striking Jupiter. We were also able to use Gemini to tell us how uh, material from deeper in the atmosphere was lofted up 
by the big explosion that resulted from this impact. And indeed, this is a cross section of ammonia gas in the stratosphere of Jupiter, which has no business being there. It's only there because it was lofted up by this, uh, this expanding impact plume resulting from that collision. Now, these events take day, obviously the impact happens extremely quickly. The debris scar may last for a period of weeks to months and all of that time it's evolving. So this uh, rapid response from places like VLT and the IRTF was essential for diagnosing the conditions that had happened uh, during that impact. Let's move into the slightly longer term now and require data over multiple months and if not multiple years. And here's an example for what's known as the equatorial heartbeat of Jupiter. Now, Earth has something called the quasi-biennial oscillation, a regular 28-month pattern where the winds in the stratosphere over the equator flip direction back and forth. Back in the 90s, it was discovered that Jupiter has something that's the same and Saturn also has a similar oscillation in the stratosphere. And you can see that the highlighted region of this, these uh, seven micron images of Jupiter show a band of warm emission at the equator, which comes and goes with time. And it has a cycle that's anywhere between six years in the 1980s to about four years in the late 90s and early 2000s. And what we're seeing is that that cycle, um, it appears to be perturbed by weather um, and meteorology happening down deeper within the atmosphere. So if you have a huge storm system erupting, then that stratospheric oscillation can be modified and shift phase even for the ensuing uh, few years. And of course, you need long term observations to be able to deduce those sorts of changes. Now, those changes aren't limited to the stratosphere. On the right hand side of this um, slide, you can see images of Jupiter in visible light and images of Jupiter near five microns. These are actually measured by the IRTF. Note the difference between late 2010 and early 2011 for the South Equatorial Belt. That belt had almost completely whitened over and disappeared, and that corresponded to a complete absence of five micron flux. You've got a haze sat above the belt that was preventing light uh, from deeper in the atmosphere from welling up. And on the left-hand side, you see just how variable a north-south cut through the uh, brightness at five microns really is with the north equatorial belt breathing in and breathing out once every four or five years and the southern equatorial belt fading away completely. Now we don't fully understand why these are taking place but it's something again that we can track over long spans of time. Another example of uh, cycles that happen within the atmosphere was discovered only recently using a long span of data. Now on the left, top left, you can see the equator of Jupiter looking extremely bright at five microns. And this is something that we hardly ever see. Normally it looks like the appearance you see in 2016 there in front of you. And in fact, looking at the long-term record, we saw these cloud clearing events allowing five micron flux through happened every six to seven years or so. Now it's not linked to Jupiter's annual cycle. Jupiter isn't seasonal, it's got a tiny three degree axial tilt and yet it has this bizarre six to seven year period that we're still trying to understand. It must be something to do with the storage of uh, convective available potential energy that it then relinquishes in large storm systems like the one you see in front of you. So over medium timescales, we see natural cycles of meteorological activity within these giant planets that we're struggling and still attempting to understand. We also are able to track the evolution of small vortices, such as the great red spot on the left-hand side, oval BA there on the right-hand side, and a series of wave patterns that we can see over the various belts. And I want to focus on just one wave pattern in particular that has been discovered because we're able to now use burst mode on uh, Vizier on the VLT. On the left, you can actually see a movie cycling through, which is a series of individual frames from the burst mode that we used on Vizier, where we can then select via some sort of algorithm, select the sharpest frames and collapse those to create superb images of Jupiter at five microns. Now, that allowed us to detect a very, very fine, and I say fine, fine on Jupiter means on the order of about a thousand kilometers, a fine wave packet 
in the North Equatorial Belt. And you might say, well, I'm not sure I believe you from that slide that you've got in front of you on the screen. But a few months later, we then looked with the Juno spacecraft and were able to see exactly the same wave pattern over exactly the same region. So what this is showing is that sometimes ground-based mid-infrared astronomy can do things from the ground that was only previously possible from a spacecraft. And we've been using the uh, Juno, uh, the, the burst mode on Vizier for every time we've been able to do so, coinciding with Juno observations ever since. Now, in the final part of the talk, I'll move to longer timescales. And here we require observations over a year's worth, and I mean a Saturnian year's worth of data. So 30 years in this case. This is a montage of images from the VLT of the troposphere and stratosphere of Saturn. And you might say there's not a lot taking place uh, in between those different years. But if you look in the bottom right, you can see how the slow seasonal progression of Saturn as it moves around the sun is causing a reversal in the asymmetry in the temperatures from what you might expect to be cold in the uh, uh, northern hemisphere in wintertime to being warmer in the summertime. Now, of course, Cassini tracked all of this for 13 years and gave us an exquisite database to work with. But with Cassini's demise in 2017, now we absolutely rely on ground-based facilities to be able to continue to track uh, those features. Which Vizier has done in 2018 and Subaru has been done in, doing in 2019 and 2020. And if you squint and turn your head sideways with the image in the top right-hand corner, you can just about see the thermal infrared hexagon at the north pole of Saturn with a central warm cyclone right there in the heart. Now up until recently you could only do that with a spacecraft and it's the beautiful plate scale of the Aquarius detector on Vizier that allows us to resolve that feature in the northern hemisphere. Moving even further out, Uranus uh, is extremely cold, making it very challenging to look at in the mid-infrared. But here I'm comparing images in 2009 from the top to 2018 at the bottom. And you can see that if you look at the stratosphere on the left, compared to the troposphere on the right, the distribution of thermal flux is very different. In the troposphere, the equator is warm. In the stratosphere, the equator is cold. And in fact, on the bottom right, we were able to track that over multiple years and say that the troposphere hasn't really changed at all since the time of Voyager 2, whereas the stratosphere seems to have evolved quite substantially. That simulation, the spinning balls that you see on the slide in front of you is from a postdoc at Leicester called Mike Roman, who looked at what Uranus would have looked like if we'd have had something like the VLT for the past 84 years of its seasonal cycle. And you can see again that uh, the appearance in the stratosphere and the troposphere are rather different. Now, the other thing I'd love to point out in this image is that for the first time ever, Vizier detected the rings of Uranus. Nobody has done that before in the thermal infrared. And this image in 2018, when I first reduced the data, I thought it was noise that I was seeing on the image. I was blown away to think that we could actually detect something so cold and so faint out there in the outer solar system. Finally, let's move very quickly to Neptune. Now here again, we see a connection between the troposphere and the stratosphere. This is that image I showed at the very beginning, which seems to show perturbations in methane emission that's uh, resulting from storms upwelling from deep within Neptune, bringing methane gas up so that it can emit here in the mid infrared at eight microns. We've recently completed a study with Vizier that looks at Neptune over long spans of time. And what I want you to focus on on the right hand side is how 2005, 2018 and 2020 appear to be outliers compared with all of the other years in this sequence. And we believe that there was some kind of sub-seasonal activity, maybe related of, uh, with outbursts of storm activity that caused a dramatic cooling at the uh, equator of Neptune compared to other latitudes. Now, I should say that these look like they've got quite a lot of uncertainty on them, but this was repeatable over several nights of observations in each year. So this is quite a consistent change that we're seeing over a span of only two decades or so. Now, that might sound like a long time until you think that it takes uh, 165 years for Neptune to go around the sun. So unexpected sub-seasonal changes in the atmosphere of Neptune. Now, let's finally look ahead uh, to what we've got to look forward to. Now, everything I've told you about has relied on a large number of ground-based infrared facilities over several 
decades. And unfortunately, we're heading into a period where a lot of those facilities are going away. At the IOTF, we can now only use the Texies instrument. Subaru has just decommissioned its Comics instrument. T-Rex and Michelle on Gemini were fantastic, but went away a few years ago. Keck LWS is a thing of the past. And sadly, Canary Cam on Grantacam is something that uh, we won't be seeing much of in the near future, which leaves us with Texies and the VLT. Now, Texies is a wonderful instrument, as we heard in the previous presentation. Each pixel in the colour image on the bottom right hand side just there is a separate spectrum of Jupiter that we can invert to try to measure the atmospheric conditions within the clouds. And so it is fabulous, but it's a PI instrument and it's not on the, on the uh, observatories regularly enough to do the kind of timescale analyses that I've just been talking about. So finally, what would we desire if we wanted to look to the future with mid-infrared observations, aside from having more instruments to do this science? For Jupiter, which is 45 arc seconds across at, uh, at its opposition, we need wide field of views and large chop knob throws so we're not having to do mosaic. -ing. We want to be able to support missions in the future, such as Juno, such as uh, JUICE with ESA, ultimately the James Webb Space Telescope and Europa Clipper as well, which requires making sure that these mid-infrared capabilities are maintained over the coming decade. We want to be able to access short and rapid response observations, as well as long-term monitoring of these planets with combination of imaging and uh, spectroscopy. And one day we would hope that we'd be able to do something like the broad spectral and spatial coverage of something like the IFU on uh, JWST MIRI in order to get spatial and spectral information at the same time. So realizing that my time is running out or has run out, I'll leave you this beautiful montage of the giant planets from the VLT and uh, just remind you that the main thing we're trying to do in the mid-infrared is to track the environmental conditions on these four worlds as archetypes or templates for the um, pantheon of extrasolar planets and brown dwarfs that are out there. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Lee. That was a really, really nice talk. Um, okay, I think we have uh, a few questions. So uh, first question is from Leo Bircher on uh, Slack. Uh, he's asking, does the study of climates on other planets also feed back to a better understanding of models for our Earth's climate? So what we tend to do is slightly the other way around. Um, that is certainly a line I would use with a, a research council in order to get funding. But in reality, what happens is we take a model that has been developed for terrestrial applications. We often strip out a lot of the more complicated physics, such as the interaction with the surface and the ocean. And then we try to see whether it still works under the extreme uh, temperature conditions and different gaseous conditions of the outer solar system. And what we tend to find is that the models that have been developed for terrestrial application genuinely do work in these more extreme uh, conditions. But when you see discrepancies between model and data, that's where the interesting discoveries are made. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to display my, my utter ignorance of planetary science by asking a very naive question about phosphine. So, uh, of course, most of us saw the discovery of phosphine on Venus and the associated press release, which uh, was um, attributing this to possibly biological processes. So if you see phosphine on Jupiter, can you explain in simple terms why you don't think it is due to biological processes? It all comes down to chemistry in, in the long run. So on Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune, their phosphorus content is from the material that was originally accreted into those planets in the first place. So those, uh, those planetesimals, if you like, would have had plenty of phosphorus there within it. Now that phosphorus then becomes hydrogenated and reduced to form phosphine gas. And because there's so much hydrogen on the giant planets and not very much oxygen to remove that uh, phosphine gas, uh, you're always going to find phosphine in these giant planet atmospheres. Now on Venus, you have an atmosphere which doesn't, isn't conducive to having phosphine gas present. Um, you don't have the same high temperature, high pressure reducing conditions as you find within giant planet interiors. And so there, the detection of phosphine is certainly more puzzling, could have something to do with geochemical reactions and volcanism that we still don't fully understand, or it could potentially have something to do with a biological activity. Very nice. We actually have a follow-up question on this from, uh, from Leo Bircher. So uh, since you mentioned this uh, 
uh, in the visible spectrum of Jupiter. So I was wondering about the sensitivity of how the sensitivity of this of this year for phosphine compares to ALMA, for which detection uh, mm. came. Yeah, so ALMA obviously doing that work in the submillimeter in order to see a single rotational line of phosphine. There are two excellent bands of phosphine that you can use. One is at about 4.3 microns, just on the other side of the M band, and another is at 10 microns, which is the one that I traditionally use for looking at phosphine distributions on Jupiter and Saturn. And uh, I do happen to know that the Texies uh, consortium, those that uh, uh, showed some of their spectra earlier on in this uh, in this slide deck, they will be using Texies to look at the 10 micron region to see whether we could potentially detect or, or confirm the detection of phosphine within the Venusian atmosphere. You could do this with the Vizier spectrometer as well, and you could potentially do this, I believe, depending on saturation, with the Cryos Plus instrument on, on, on VLT. So there's certainly a lot of ways in which we can confirm the detection or lack thereof of phosphine. Now the question of interpretation, we have to leave to those who are chemists and biologists. 